Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome mm -hmm. back to Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. Uh, what an exciting night. We haven't seen you for, I think it's been about six weeks. And in that time, we had the World Martial Arts Live. And also, you know, if, if you're in my province, which is uh, not the best in the world, but things are opening up. We're, 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 we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel, but it's still so nice to see you through the screen right now. We're always privileged uh, and, and honored when you join us. My name's Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts of Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. And yeah, we're super excited to be back. We always have a little pre-chat uh, to make sure our guest is ready and we're ready. And the excitement we have, not just for our guests, but for being together with each other and also with you is palpable. Um, my excitement always includes introducing Sensei Nicholas Suino. And uh, every week I mention that he's an eighth in in Muso Jikita Nishinru Iaido and a sixth in in Judo, a sixth in in Jiu Jitsu. Um, there's one thing I want to say about him, and then I actually have a quick question for him, which is I was chatting with some friends today. I had no role model growing up, and I never want this to be a thing about age, but as we age and we maintain excellence or strive to, I had no role model for what Sensei Suino is growing up. There's nobody I knew over the age of about 48 who could do 10 push ups, let alone 100 who could do a Tough mutter and then do a sword for four hours and then do a crucible for 12 hours. Sensei Suino, you're quite literally, and to this day to me, a role model of what next phases of life can be. But there was nobody who looked or acted like you above, I'll say, age 48, where I grew up. And it's an honor to be your student and your friend. Um, my questions for you are, I, I know your sword style title, but I never introduced your judo or jujitsu styles. Well, so you're asking me? Yeah, to, what they are? To, yeah, well, so so judo is a is a worldwide martial art and sport, right? So okay. it all is Kodokan judo, although there are different organizations associated with that. So anybody who does you know judo is doing the same thing. Um, so that's a big art. The mm -hmm. other one is very small. I do something uh, that's called Nihon Jujitsu. Some people call it Satoru Nihon Jujitsu. Um, there may be sort of a hundred avid practitioners of that in the whole in the whole planet. So it's just, uh, you know, there's a very big difference between uh, the, the, the two arts. Well, amazing. Um, I'm guessing you didn't have any role models like yourself. And how are you doing this week? Yeah, I'm doing great, thanks. You know, it's funny, what, what came to mind when you said that was uh, when my dad turned 50, he said, thank God I'm 50, I can now, I can, I can be an old fart and, and uh, you know, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did, right? Uh, continued to drink and smoke like a madman and, uh, uh, took himself to an early grave. So I had a lot of opposite opposition role models. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I got to Japan, right, Yamaguchi Sensei, my sword instructor was 80 years old and was training, you know, three times a day for a total of nine hours. So uh, that that woke me up to the possibility that you can do this stuff for a long, long time. But thanks for teeing that up. I really appreciate it. It always falls to me when we have these wonderful opportunities to meet over Zoom to introduce Randy Dauphin, uh, sensei to many, student to me, student to Machi Legacy as well. Uh, Randy, it's great to see you and great to have the pleasure of introducing you. Since we've been off for a little while, um, I just want to remind people of the basics, right? Uh, Randy is the seventh don in Shorinru Karate, third, third don in Asian Yu Iaido, uh, first don in uh, Seite Iaido that is administered by the Canadian Kendo Federation. He's been doing martial arts. I know he's been doing karate since 1989. Uh, he's been training with me for, I don't know, 20 plus years, 25 years, um, and has a wide range of interests, including things like CrossFit, uh, you know, extreme sports of all kinds, uh, and is one of the most avid martial artists I know. He lives, eats, sleeps, and breathes martial arts. Uh, Randy, Great to see you. How are you doing? I'm good, Sensei. Yeah, one of the best things about that is when they say work from home, I get to come here to the dojo and just be here even more and work from the dojo. So it's it's good to be that way. And it's good to see you. It seems like, uh, well, you and I have been chatting on Zoom a little bit here and there, which has been nice. But man, I am so excited to have our crew back together and chatting tonight and super excited to uh, have the champ Fitz here and to do this introduction. So as I always do, I get to introduce um, our guest of honor as well as Sensei Legacy. 
Um, so that's the legacy is a 10th degree black belt. And he was awarded that rank by his teacher, Anthony Sandoval, whom he still trains with and has the most utmost respect for. He's a member of the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. He's an author. This book right here, The Elite Fighter, as is Sensu Suino, by the way. Um, you can get both of their books through me. If you're interested where to find them, contact me and I'll let you know where to do that. Um, in addition to Anthony Sandoval, he's also been a student of Harold Warden, Benny Allen, Richard Kim. And we don't want to forget that he actually is a student of Sensu Suino's and he received his Shodan and Iaido from Sensu Suino as well. Um, I was thinking today about Sensei Legacy and I was thinking, you know, he's a real sensei. He's, he's a real sensei, not like one of these people who just come, like not like a cardboard cutout of a, a karate teacher that you see. He's his own person and he's a real, real sensei. And for so many years we drove around and he would say things to me and I couldn't relate to them, but now often I find myself relating to what he says and often I feel like him. And he used to always say, Randy, I feel like Benny Allen. He would say that to me regularly. And now a lot of times I feel like Sensei Legacy, but I just wanna make it clear. Um, I don't feel like Sensei Legacy as he is now. I feel like he was when he was 49 because it would be impossible for me to feel like he is now at 75, having been in martial arts for over 50 years. Um, and when I say he's a real sensei, that's what I mean, because you can't catch up to a real sensei, because when you get to where they are, they've moved on to another spot, and then you have to chase them to that new spot, right? And Sensei Legacy is a prime example of that. Um, another thing about a real sensei is that, you know, let's say when you're a beginner before you're a quitter at 30 years, if you quit before 30 years, right? When you start and you're at that 15 year mark, 20 year mark, for me, Sensei Legacy did everything for me. He did all kinds of stuff. So if I won, he congratulated me better than anybody else congratulated me. And if I failed and I felt discouraged, he was a person who built me up and made me feel good again and helped to pick me up and brush myself off. If I felt scared, he was a person who was always whispering in my ear, you got this, you can do this. And it just gave you that little bit of courage if I was indecisive, he pushed me to make a decision. You know, his whole job, when you have a sensei, his whole job is about you, not about him. His whole job is about you. And Sensei Legacy ex exemplifies that. His whole job has been about me and thousands of other people for decades and decades now, five decades to be specific. Um, and I think what students often forget and what I've been contemplating a lot is that you actually provide something to your sensei as well. And you need to live up to that obligation that's been delivered to you for two, five, 10, 15, 20 years. You're obliged to pay that back to that person. And when you do that, you're paying that back to the martial arts. Last thing I wanna say about Sensei Legacy is he's a huge Montreal Canadian fan. He bought <laughs> that hat. And he bought me this coffee mug that I'm drinking out of too. And we're into the third round of the playoffs. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but I'm excited about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but now it's my job to introduce, my job and my privilege to introduce uh, the champ, Fitz, the whip Vanderpool. I'll start by just going down a number of the titles that he's held uh, in 1993, he was the Canadian amateur champion. That was his first championship. Um, he's the Canadian Professional Boxing Federation champion, the WBF Intercontinental title, the WBC welterweight, uh, Fakara box title, the WBF super welterweight world title, the WBC super welterweight, uh, Fakara box title. He's also the oldest Canadian champion in Canadian history at 45, and he succeeded George Chevalio in earning that title. Um, he is the owner of um, Vanderpool Fitness and Boxing in Waterloo. Uh, he's also a person who facilitates fitness and boxing programs in our community and in our region of Waterloo, teaching students fitness through boxing and inspiring them to be successful individuals. 
Uh, having lived the dream of becoming a world champion, Fitz also speaks at many schools um, and does a lot of motivational speaking. Uh, he's an international fire safety and speaks on fire safety prevention. Uh, he's one of the first 10 people included in the Eastwood Collegiate Wall of Recognition. And I mention that because both of my daughters went to Eastwood Collegiate and they're all Eastwood Collegiate alumni. Um, and in 2008, Fitz the Whip, he was inducted into the Waterloo County Sports Hall of Fame. For me, I always give some, those are a bunch of great facts about Fitz, very impressive. Most humans I know don't come close to having those types of accolades, but I'm gonna say some things that I think to be more important. Um, I think he's one of Canada's greatest all-time boxers. Um, and he deserves to have his name mentioned with people like Lennox Lewis and George Chevalier and Otis Grant and Arturo Gotti. These people are all Canadian boxers. And why do I say this? The World Boxing Federation and the World Boxing Counter Council, the people who ranked Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hitman Hearns, Mike Tyson, the GOAT Muhammad Ali, they ranked Fitz as the world champion as well. The same people that you just heard me mention ranked it. Those same association that ranked those people ranked the champ here as well as the world champion. All right. I'm excited. The first time, I just want to tell a little story. First time I met Fitz, a person named Josh Hanley, who's a high ranking black belt in our club and I, we were going to Hadashita to train with Chuck Liddell. <clears throat> Everybody was streaming in to go in. I looked to my left and I'm a big boxing fan. And I said to Josh, I said, do you know who that guy is over there? He said, I don't have any fucking idea who that guy is. Then I said, well, you should know who that guy is. I said, that's Fitz the Whip Vanderpool. I said, he's the welterweight world champion. And I remember I walked over to him and just said, you know, you don't get an opportunity to walk up to these people every day. I stuck my hand out and said, champ, could I shake your hand? And he's like, yeah, I said, I'm a big fan. And, and I remember I said to him, could I get a picture with you? And he kind of looked around and he said, we can do a picture, but uh, let's keep it discreet because this is Chuck's event. So I thought that's pretty cool. He's being very respectful to the person um, who is actually running that event. That's our first meeting. Since then, Legacy Shoranru has had a dojo in his gym. We've taught at many similar seminars, Weekend Warriors. We've had dinner together. Uh, I've trained in his gym with him. Uh, I've helped him when he was running for member of parliament. We have similar friends, James and Adet uh, from Heritage and Driftwood. And I think he's a champion in and out of the ring. Um, people call him Fitz the Whip, but to me, I always just call him the champ. And it's not because of what he does in the ring. The other reason why I call him the champ is because if you don't know it, he raises money for the food bank. He goes to the hospital and sits with kids who are dying of cancer and reads them stories. He inspires people everywhere he goes and he tries to do good everywhere that he can. And honestly, in my community, in this community in Kitchener, Waterloo, I think he is like the, the shining example of a person who helps their community as much as they possibly can. And that, to, that is my introduction for the champ. Fits the Whip Vanderpool. He's always going to be the champ for my whole life. I'm always going to call him the champ. Take Thanks, Sensei. Yeah, I'm going to do some real quick housekeeping for the people watching because we want to get into this. So first thing to know is that at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat button if you're watching on Zoom and uh, we'll take your live questions there. You want to get those questions in early. Um, you know, our, our, our format has us beginning and ending on time these days. Uh, Robert, our host tonight, he threw down there, you should all have a little notification. So put your questions in there and uh, we'll pass them on as they get passed on to us. The other thing is this is five adults on a talk show. And if you don't like any of the content, we don't care. Uh, you can ask your, uh, your mother, your father to uh, plug your ears and uh, tell you when the naughty bits are done. But we're just having a chat here. And the same way that I was privileged to sit in the back seat when my senseis chatted, uh, I'm privileged to be facilitating any part of this. And, uh, and, and I believe you might consider it the same. Um, Champ, what a pleasure. We've met. 
Uh, it was a pleasure then. I got to train in your dojo as part of a day event. Um, how does it feel? Because I see you looking down when certain really lovely things are being said by Sensei Dolphin. And I know you're accepting them, but I also know you're humble about it. How does it feel to be introduced this way? Well, it's, um, it's, it's a pleasure. It's, um, it, it's humbling. Um, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I'm almost speechless. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's tough, but I'm honored um, that he feels that way and that he sees what I do in the community and who I am as a person. Um, it's one thing, you know, as an athlete to, to be a champion, to be, be a six time professional champion, but those championship belts, they'll come and go. Mm. It's another thing to be honored and to be looked at for what you do in your community and for making a difference in the lives of kids who are sick, underprivileged kids, youth who are, you know, youth who need empowerment. It's, it, that, that's a lasting thing. I mean, my championship belts are, yeah, they're great. They're where they are, but they come and go. It's the imp impact that I have on the kids on this community that will last a lifetime. And um, it's 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 an honor to to be recognized for that for that to be said that you know he thinks that those things are are, are more important. Or you recognize those things as my way of giving back and what I've done because there's not very many athletes that do that kind of stuff. Mm. When you see a lot of athletes giving back, visiting hospitals. <clears throat> or stuff like that, they're one-time knockoffs. They're being paid to do that. Like the Wayne Gretzky's or whoever it is, they're being paid as part of their contract to go see kids in the hospital. Um, it's mm -hmm. another thing to go back and visit them on your own time, on your own dime, because the most precious thing we have in life, the most precious thing, it's not diamond, it's not gold, it's not money. The most precious thing we have is time. Mm -hmm. And once you give up your time, that time is gone. You can never get it back. And I give that to this community. I give that to the kids that I visit in the hospital time and time again, because there's nothing more precious than seeing the smile of a kid who's got cancer, who knows that they're going to die. And there's nothing better than sitting in a room with those, these kids and chatting and, hot and seeing them smile. Like, that's priceless. You can't put a price on that. Thanks, champ. That's huge. That's huge. And we're going to get into, I, I want to crack that really wide open a bit later. So let's now jump back to your childhood. You're born in Trinidad and Tobago. What do you remember about that before you came to Canada? And also, what was your childhood like that led you into that first gym where you first started throwing hands? Well, yeah, I remember back in Trinidad and Tobago, I remember, you know, going to school and actually my favorite time was always at lunchtime because, you know, the, the recess and stuff, because we'd, we'd get eat crackers, milk and crackers, you know, or milk and cookies. And uh, biscuits, we say back in Trinidad, biscuits, milk and biscuits. Um, but no, I, I came, I remember coming to Canada when I was uh, leaving Canada, coming out at five, six to Canada. I remember my parents pulling me, I was under the table and I was holding onto the leg of the table and I wouldn't let go because they told me we were coming to Canada. And what I knew about Canada was this place that it was cold and this white stuff came down, it was cold. And, you know, I was like, here I am in Trinidad running around in shorts. I'm climbing the trees, picking mangoes off the trees, just having fun, you know, and now they're telling me I can't be in this warm atmosphere anymore. I gotta come up here where it's cold. And I just, I sat on that table and I had, I held that leg and I didn't want to let go. But uh, my father knew it was an opportunity to give his kids a better way of life. So he brought us up to Canada and, um, you know, six years old I was. Um, I had four of the brothers at the time. My fifth brother was born up here in Canada. Uh, I remember um, when we started boxing, uh, my oldest brother, see, I'm the middle child of, three, of five kids. I'm the middle child of five kids. So my oldest brother was getting picked on as a kid. So my dad, my dad said, okay, I got to teach you how to defend yourself. So he brought us to the Waterloo Regional Boxing Academy. And my three older brothers, we started learning how to box from there. And then my other brothers came into it and eventually started learning how to box as well. So it became a family affair. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, I, I probably lost my first couple of fights, but I just kept at it. You know, I just kept at it because I wanted to, you know, wanted to get to the point where I won. Mm. And I just kept at it. And then, you know, eventually down the road, you know what, me and my brothers were getting good at it. So we just kept doing it. 
So let's you know? back up just a little. So when you enter that that club, how old are you? What's it smell like? What's it look like? What's going on around you? Were you hooked immediately? Like what kept you there? And then how long between then and your first, you know, real bouts? Well, okay, so I started I started at the age of nine. I started at the boxing academy at the age of nine. And um you know, I think I was just, I was there. I mean, you know, it was, it was a small gym. So you could, you could smell the, you know, the smell sweat. It had a sweaty atmosphere. You know, there were a couple of us in there and, you know, you see guys, you know, pounding away at the bag, just like in the movies. And it was like, wow, you know, this is kind of cool. So I think for me, like I said, I, I probably had my first, my first fight or two I lost, but I just kept at it because I wanted to, I wanted to have that victory, that feeling of having my hands raised, you know, so I kept at it and, you know, finally, I started winning some fights. Um, you know, coach got us ready. It, well, yeah, I went in a competition. You know, then I started getting to go to tournaments. I got I got on the provincial team a couple years later. I got on the provincial team. I started traveling, you know, to different different parts of the province, represent Team Ontario. I remember when I was 13 years old, I met this guy. I was 13 years old. And this is an experience that has always stuck with me because I'll, I'll tell you why in a sec. So I was representing Team Ontario. And I fought this kid from BC and all the other fighters on team Ontario won their fight. And I was the only guy I lost. I lost to a guy from BC and it was in Montreal. And this guy was in the crowd. And when I came out of the ring after losing the fight, he grabbed my hand and he gave me this bag, this package. And I just kind of like, okay, I just lost the fight. And this guy's give me this, you know, this package. He thinks, you know, so I took the package, you know, and, when I got back to my, my room, I opened it up and there was like a t-shirt and the calendar and some of the little trinkets. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why would this guy give me this? I mean, I just lost the fight. You know, I lost the decision. And um, so when I got back home, I you know, told my mom, I said, you know, and I, I started writing this guy. This was when I was 13. And every year, every year at Christmas, myself and this guy from Montreal would exchange gifts. He would send me this calendar some t-shirts and stuff, pictures. I would send him some some stuff back in return, t-shirts, my whip t-shirts, whatever like that. And to this day, we still do that. We've been mm. doing that since 13. And for me, what that told me was that, you know, I said to myself, why me? Because I'm the guy who lost this fight. I lost the decision anyways. The referee told me I lost. But something in this guy's mind, somehow I was a winner to him. And you know, I, I still am to this day, you know, and that is something that propels me to go forward because just because I didn't get the, that decision, my hand wasn't raised as the winner, did not mean I did not win that fight because in this guy's mind, I was a winner and, and he believed me so much that every year since 13, we've been sending each other stuff at Christmas time. That's an amazing friendship to have. That's um, incredible. Yeah. What yeah. a gift. And so were you calling yourself Whip back then? No. Okay. No. That came Whip. later. Sorry, go ahead. That came later, yeah? Yeah, that came down earlier, yeah. Got it. I thought I heard you said that. So when you're this age, you know, you're, you're representing the province, you're in the ring, you're obviously doing okay, but let's say that fight you didn't win. Did you have an indication that this was for you or was this just for fun and I want to win some fights? You know, at what point did you realize, oh, I think I might be good at this, like really good? Well, okay. So, I mean, you know, I, coming along the way, you know, it was, it was fun. And then I think in 1984, um, I was getting tired because at this point I was in grade nine. So my friends were my friends were going out, you know, you're in grade nine, you know, friends getting out, socializing, dating, going to movies and stuff. And my brothers and I, we're, we're just in the gym training. We'd come home from school. We'd, uh, we'd come home, we'd train, we'd get in the gym, train, da, 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 to go homework. And then it was, then it was the bed. And it got to the point where I was like, well, you know what? I mean, I didn't have any social life. And I kept, I kind of thought, well, you know what? I mean, this isn't fun anymore. So, um, in 1984, uh, my father had our open up our own boxing club right across from uh, Eastwood Collegiate. It was part of, we owned half of Popeye's gym. The gym we had open up was called Little Archie's. 
and it got broken into. Um, so what happened was I decided to quit in 84. And then I saw my friends in the 88 Olympics, Seoul, Korea. I saw a number of my friends, Lennox, Asif, Dar, and a couple other guys were out there and they were fighting on TV in Seoul, Korea in 84. And I was sitting back on TV watching and I said, wow. I said, I used, I was fighting with those guys. I could have been there with those guys where they are right now. And I said, you know what? I said, woulda, coulda, shoulda. I said, you know what? I'm going to start back training and I'm going to go to the next Olympics, which is 1992, Barcelona, Spain. So in 89, I jumped back, started training, got back on the, uh, got back on the provincial team, started fighting the, uh, the, the, the then Canadian champion, who was uh, Mark the Duke, God rest his soul. I fought him in 1984, or no, 89, sorry, 1990, 1991, 1992. I lost him all four times for the national championship. Fought him for the Pan Am Games. Going up for the world championships six times in four years when I came back. I was beating everybody else leading up to the champion. The champion would sit on top of his throne and he would wait for whoever would fight their way up to come up to him next. And that was always me. I'd be knocking this guy out, knock this guy out, stop this guy. And I, every time the champion would see me sitting in front of his face, you know, and it was always me and him. And I kept losing to him six times in a row. Mm. Now, keep in mind, in baseball, you get three strikes and you're out. Strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. Boom, you're gone. I lost this guy one, two, three, four, five, six times. But I knew that I was losing the decision to the judges. I didn't think that I lost some of those fights. I knew and I felt that I won them. So I said, I'm not going to quit because man is making that decision for me. Finally, now, in 1992, the seventh time I was getting ready to fight him, this was to go to the Olympic trials to represent Canada. And I was determined because this is why I came back those four years now was to get ready for this. So um, I got ready for that fight, and I fought the then Canadian champion, Mark the Duke, again, seven times, and I finally beat him. So... Now I said to myself, I'm sitting in the ring, they announced my name as a winner. I'm like, I'm like, wow, I just I just finally beat him. I said, I can go, I'm going to the Olympics now. As I'm walking out the ring, they say, they announced and say that the challenger has to beat the champion twice in order to go to the Olympics. The challenger has to beat the champion twice. And that's when I said to myself, <laughs> okay, I guess I mean I'd be going after all. So I fought him the next day. I was the only challenger to beat a champion. I fought him the next day. And they were doing computer scoring. This computer scoring just came in. So the top, top, you had three, four judges around the ring. He said, got to you know, give him a point. Top, top, you get a point. And uh, he won that fight. They gave him the win on that fight. I won the first round and I won the second round, but lost the third round. But the way the computer scoring goes, if they gave him like they gave him more points than they gave me. So his total points were more than mine. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyways, they, so he went, <laughs> he, he went as representative for Canada for the Olympics, Barcelona, Spain. And I was really disappointed. And I thought, you know what, I'm not going to stay and play this politics more. I'm going to have to step off and go into the pros where I can make that decision myself. So anyways, Mark went on to the Olympics and he went on to win a silver medal for Canada. He brought back a silver medal for Canada. And, um, you know, I remember the, uh, the media contacted me and they said, how do I feel about Mark winning a silver medal for Canada? And just roll off my tongue and I said, you know what? If Canada is happy with a silver medal, then I'm happy. For Canada. <laughs> okay. Um, because, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I was just, I was anxious. I want to, you know, to, to meet Mark in the pros. I want us to fight in the pros when it's more than just three or four rounds where it's these guys deciding who wins that fight. I want to fight uh -huh. them 10 or 12 rounds so that can be answered between us in the ring, who the better man really is. Um, so yeah, so that's how that, that story ended up. And then after that, I stayed 
won the, won the nationals the next year. And then I turned pro in, in January, 1993. So when we get to the pro uh, idea, I want to throw it to Sensei Dofa. He knows a lot more about boxing than I know I do, but I want to ask you a question before we get there, partly for the young people listening. I think it'll be useful for all of us. How important is losing and feeling the frustration of that loss? Is that myself? I'm asking you, yeah. What do you think about that? Well, you know what? I think I think losing is uh losing is a good thing. Losing is not really a bad thing because it's all in what you take from your loss. And for me, when I lose, per se, like when I lost to Mark for this year for the Olympic bid, you know, having lost to him six times, I learned not to give up. I learned that if I if I kept at it. I can crack that ceiling and get to and be victorious. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did in showing, you know, I mean, like I said, they say strike one, strike two, strike three out. I don't know how many other fighters would have kept on going, trying year after year after year after losing like that. And I broke through the seventh time to finally beat them. You know, um, losing now, I mean, it's like when I turned pro, um, I lost, um, I lost the fight where I got knocked. I got knocked down, and um, from one of my losses, actually, my loss, I lost the former IBF world champion Charles Charles the Natural Murray. He was natural. They called him the Natural because he was naturally good. Oh man! Oh, it's uh, interesting. The um oh. Okay, I'm, I'm just, this, this battery life is killing me. I'm trying to, uh, my juice is taking some here, but it's not, um, anyways, let's see how long ago. Hopefully we make it to 930. <laughs> my pocket juice is, give me, but it's got, uh, it's low on juice and it keeps going down. Anyways, um, yeah, so, so I fought Charles and Ashley Murray and, um, He knocked me. He knocked me out in the uh, in the sixth round. And uh, after that fight, I was I was advised to quit boxing. But um, I knew in my heart, in my mind, I didn't want to. I knew that there was more. I could give more to the sport. So I didn't quit. Um, I kept I kept training, worked hard, and that's when my opportunity. After that that fight where I got knocked out, I got offered a chance to fight for Tony Tony Badia for the Canadian title. Now, Tony Badia was 13 and 0 with 10 knockouts. 13 and 0 with 10 knockouts. He was knocking everybody out. And um, they set me up to get knocked out by this guy. But I trained hard and uh, he knocked me down in the first round, Tony. He knocked me down in the first round. I was just kind of going, you know what? I got to win this fight. Because I told everybody or anybody who would listen to me back in Kitchener that I was going to bring the belt back. Now, this is going to be the first professional championship belt ever brought back to the Tri-Cities. And I was determined to be the first guy to do it. And um, so when he knocked me down the first round, I came back and I kept I kept going at him. He was hitting me with shots that would have knocked most guys out, would have stopped most guys, but it wasn't stopping me because I was determined to do what I wanted to do, which was win that fight. And uh, so the second round, third round, I kept going at 20. You know, he kept throwing punches. I kept going at him, backing him up. Then finally, and finally, you know, by the fourth round, um, he's got some cut, cut on over, over this side, cut on this side. And you can hear the commentators going, oh, well, Tony has a, has a way of cutting himself with his laces. He scratches himself with his laces. Well, if you look at the gloves, they were taped up. There were no laces. So I don't know where these cuts were coming from. So I'm going on, keep, you know, and then in, in the sixth round, here comes the whip. Hit him with the whip. With hope it's possible. Back him up. Got him on the ropes. He's just back on the ropes. You know, referee stepped in, stopped the fight. He's got blood all over his face. I got him messed up. Referee stepped in, stopped the fight. I'm like, yes, yes. You know what? I won the fight. You know, now it wasn't until later on that night when I got outside the ring that I realized what I did, that I actually was the Canadian champion. When the fresh year had the belt on, 
stepped outside, the fresh air hit me. I'm like, wow, it's not a dream. It's real. I am the champion. You know, and uh, yeah, like I was just so excited to bring the first belt back to the city just to show them what could be possible. If you believe in yourself, work hard, dedicate yourself, that you can accomplish anything you want to, you know? So yeah, it was a great honor to, uh, to overcome the odds of adversity to do such a feat. That's incredible to hear, champ. I'm going to throw it to Sensei Dauphin. I see you nodding. I see your eyes lighting up. Sensei, where do you want to go with this now that we're, now that we're in the pro ranks? Um, it's, it's interesting. So I have a couple of questions about the boxing. The one thing I do want to say, so my okay. question for you is, champ, you know, you're a world champion, right? And you fought all these people. And people always want to know about, like, who is the toughest you ever fought? Like, who is the person that... But what I'm interested in to know is who were one or two of the people that you fought that never made it, but you just thought those people should have made it. Like, who would you give a shout out to right now and why? You'd be like, this guy should have made it. Um, they were so tough. And why were they so tough when you fought them? Behind your coffin. Well, there, there, are, there are a couple of guys actually that I, that I look at and I think about that, you know, I think should have made it. And... Um, that they didn't, but, you know, part of what it was was like, you know, I know growing up, you know, there were a lot of good fighters that I saw and they were very skilled. They, they had, they, they had great hands, you know, um, very skilled fighters, but, you know, I know the reason why they didn't make it was because they didn't work as hard as I did. They didn't have the drive it took to become champion. And, uh, and that's why, you know, uh, someone didn't make it and, and they were stuck where they are because they didn't have what it took uh, to become champion, to take the next step. Because, you know, everybody can say they want to be champion. Everybody can, you know, can look the role, play the role. You know, Emmett Smith, Emmett Smith, the football player, he said, because I think to myself, I come from, from a family of five boys. Five boys who were all boxers. Emmett Smith said, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. Some work harder in preseason. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, you know what? Okay, that's why I'm where I am now. And the next guy is not here. Mm. Because I worked that much harder in preseason getting ready for when that opportunity came to do what I had to do. You know? Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with you, Champ. It's, um, you know, what it was, I think it was Muhammad Ali who said, I hated every minute of training, the agony, right? Like you live, you go in the gym, you blood, you bleed, you sweat, you cry. And then you live the rest of your life in glory, right? Mm. As yeah. the champion, right? Yeah. Um, I also like right now how you talk so openly about your defeats. Um, I find it incredible that, you know, most people who are fighters, uh, myself included, I shy away from that a little bit, even though I've had them. Um, you know, I've had people beat me. You kind of, that's not what you really... But you just so openly get on this show and talk about these people that that beat you and how hard you worked and um, why is that? Do you think? Well, you know, for for me, I mean, I learned from those things. I mean, you know, when 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 um, this guy Tony or not Tony, um, when Charles the Natural Murray, when he knocked me out in the sixth round, I went down on my face and only my hand, my hand kind of, I went down, boom. My hand kind of braced me, and I managed to still get up. By the grace of God, I got up somehow to my feet. But when the referee was counting me seven, eight, my brother was in the ring holding me. And so uh, the referee stopped the fight because there's too many men in the ring. <clears throat> this thing's going here, going down here, so it's bothering me. But um, let me see, I get through the sentence here. Um, it's going to kill me. Anyway, let me get through this here. Um, so, um, yeah, so that fight, 
was in 1995. And so in 20, 20, so I guess it's 2020, it was 25 years ago. So in 2020, I called this guy up. I called Charles Denasha Murray up. And uh, I say, hey, I said, is Charles here? He said, no, nah, this is Charles Murray. I said, Charles, this is Fitz the Whip. How are you doing, man? I said, hey, he goes, he goes, wow, actually, I should, I should, let me, let me, let me do, let me do it again. I said, it's Charles Murray. He goes, oh, yeah, how are you doing? I said, Charles, man, this is Fitz the Whip, man. Hey, look good, look good to hear you. I said, well, listen, Charles, I'm calling, man, to thank you for knocking me out 25 years ago, man. He said, what? He said, I'm, I want to thank you for knocking me out 25 years ago. He goes, oh, why? I said, listen, you don't understand, you don't understand what that did for me, man. Mm. When you knocked me out, that made me work harder and push myself to get better, to do what I've done today. When you knocked me out 25 years ago, if I had to quit, I wouldn't have been a six-time professional champion I wouldn't be the oldest Canadian champion in history. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be going to some of these Hall of Fame. So I want to thank you for what you did for me. Yeah. Oh, okay, kid. Yeah. But the difference is, as you see, I never, I never had tough wars. I never got a tough. I mean, he was. Yeah. I said, I thank God. I thank God that I didn't get into tough wars, and I, you know, um, mm. but. That knockout? No, it helped me. It helped me to be who I. Oh man, this is a one percent. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> hey, we can laugh at that, can we? Oh yeah, that's that's yeah. Yeah. welcome yeah. to digital life. What do you guys want to talk about until he gets his uh, computer? Okay. In? I I just want to say I don't want to step in the ring with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that uh. I've seen some people fight him since they like at One Day Warrior and stuff like that, and they think they're gonna do something. And he's really kind to them until it's time not to be kind. And then, you know, just for like four <laughs> seconds, yeah. Yeah, for four seconds, it's like da -da, slip, slip, pop, pop. Bang, and then they're like, "Okay, I was living in a fantasy world, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh yeah, world when I thought I was going to do something here." Well, there's a video of a guy who was like a 200th ranked pro NBA player. He never played in the NBA, or maybe he played like one minute once the team was up or down 30 points. And a couple like guys who were, you know, incredibly like the best amateur players around said, "Oh, I'll play this guy." They didn't score a basket and they didn't stop him from scoring a basket. Like the difference between pro at that level and really great amateur was so great. It was laughable. And that doesn't even include someone like the champ who was an actual champ. A guy who was like 200th place is better than every guy out there who thinks he's good at basketball by about a light year. Mm -hmm. It's not it's that next level. Sensei Sweden, we're, I wanted to ask you about the lost stuff. Like, you know, you went and you kept winning the Japan championships with the sword and stuff, but what about judo? Like, did you take some hard losses there? Or, you know, I personally love the idea of losing to win. Oh, I, I mean, I've narrated that story of my first, my first night on the judo mats in, yeah. in Yokohama, you know, where I, I beat, beat up this 16 year old brown belt and then, you know, had 35 black belts beat me up for an hour and a half. Um, I, in, in judo, you know, I did well in this country, but I never expect, I never even expected to, 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 uh, to compete at any kind of, you know, noticeable level in, in Japan. And indeed, you know, I, I always say, um, 95% of the guys I trained with could kick my ass when I got to Tokyo and four years later, only 50% could. <laughs> so that was my expectation. That was, that was a lot better. That's huge. <laughs> right? um, but I never had any expectations of being a, you know, a, a contender in Japan right. in judo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember losing in the Canadian championships to a guy, <laughs> Dominic Batiglieri. Do you, do you remember, Sensei? Like, yeah. And, 
he beat me with the same technique. Like he just, it was this, this like dippy roundhouse kick that I don't know, like the more he landed it, the more I wanted to try and hit him. And it was just kind of interesting. Like even when Fitz was talking about how he adjusted to that, I remember getting in the car with Spencer Legacy and I was in the back seat and he just kept looking in the rear view mirror at me. And I was like pissed off, like nobody's mm. business. I just was so angry. And he's like, well, I'd, I'd ball you out, but I couldn't say anything that would make you feel worse than you're feeling right now. <laughs> right? So then, but, but interestingly, um, again, like I was saying about being a real sensei, he went away and thought about it. And the next time I went to the dojo, he had the answers for me that I didn't have for myself. And he just was like, Randy, he's a lefty and he's going to do that technique to you all the time. And you're going to move to your right. And when you're moving to your right, he's not going to be able to land that technique. And I just had such faith and sense of legacy and his fighting prowess. And, and the next time I fought him, I beat him. And it was funny because I beat him five, one, but I got all the points because he got one point because it was a penalty point because because <laughs> I, I did something to him that I wasn't supposed to do. So they awarded him a point. So the score was 5-1 and I got all the, all the points. <laughs> so it was that simple. Just, I mean, not that simple because you're obviously training, but listen to your coach who saw something you didn't see, implement that plan. And a guy who beat you loses to 5-1. Yeah, I think it's also because when you... Uh, you shouldn't have an expectation. And I think I went into that fight looking past that guy to somebody else. Mm. I had an expectation that I was going to move past him pretty easy to somebody else. And you only, I just said it tonight when I was teaching, you only live in this second. You don't live in any future seconds and you don't live in any past seconds. You only live now. And I got tunnel vision for sure. When he got up on me, I got tense and I got like tunnel mm. vision and he didn't. He just was like, I can't believe I'm beating this guy. Like, <laughs> I hear that because when the, the year I won our club tournament three years ago, I did exactly what you said in the final. And last year when I got silver, I didn't do what you said when it was 4-4. And I'm still mad about it. And we had a conversation that last year was going to be a tournament year for me to tighten my fighting and my timing. And then COVID hit. And I'm still waiting to go avenge that. Whether I get to do with that specific person or not, but hey, how you doing, champ? I think he's connecting to audio. There we go. Yeah. And you're still muted, champ. You got to unmute. And turn your camera on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing at him. No, yeah, I can be brave right now because he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna edit it so he'll never see it this footage know, okay, doesn't exist <laughs> and also i know him well enough that i know that he likes me so so if if i thought that he didn't like me and he wasn't gonna find humor in the things that i definitely wouldn't be saying it <laughs> <laughs> i guess you know sean it's one of those things for the champ it's a different experience um I, I always explain it this way, and he's, he's experienced this. When you're going to get on a plane and fly to another country, another place, and you, don't, you do or you don't know who might be there, but you know they all want to beat you when you get there, and they don't care about you. They only care about what the end result is. Mm -hmm. And the champ's the guy who's done that, right? He's, he's had to do that thing. He's had to walk out in Las Vegas, in Atlantic City, with thousands of people there with the lights on him, duck into that rope and look across the ring at a person who only wanted to knock him out and get that championship belt or keep that championship belt. So I have a question I wanna ask because uh, Robert just messaged us that the champ's in and out a bit with his signal. So we'll, we'll pick him up again for everybody watching, but. Sensei Suino, feather in as you will, but I'm thinking specifically more about stand-up for Hanchi Legacy and Sensei Dauphin. Um, 
a component that we don't tend to use, let's say, and most dojos don't use is full contact, right? Like you just can't be wailing at each other like that. But at what point is the touch would hurt you versus somebody just cranks you in the side of your body with a roundhouse so hard that you don't know how you'll deal with that till it happens. The reason I'm asking is because whenever I spar with boxers, they don't just acknowledge a shot. They only acknowledge a great shot. And so at what point does, how hard do you have to spar before you go, oh, it would work versus, oh, my form and timing's great, but the actual power delivery could still be a question. Who is that for? Me or Sensei? I I'd like, well, I'll ask you, Hanchi. And, and you after Sensei well, Defense. To me, if you were going to kick a boxer who was who was well-trained, they have the best techniques in the world, probably the best training. And I'm talking over the, my life. Now that you have WFMA, or excuse me, uh, MMA, and they hit hard now and they can kick you in the legs, I think that's all changing. I think the guys are taking really good care of their bodies as far as defense by um, a lot of hard conditioning. That's what you see Randy and Nick and those guys do. If I was any younger and I could stand up whenever I wanted, I'd, uh, <laughs> uh, I would be doing it too. Actually, I'm, I can get up. <laughs> I'm just a bit lazy. <laughs> so uh, I would say that uh, you do see a few people like an MMA or getting hit with body shots and knockdown. I mean, there's a lot of power. In yeah. A lot of power in the legs. Hope that was the question you asked. It was. It was definitely along the lines. What do you think, Sensei Dofa? And also, like again, that like incredibly hard sparring versus touch sparring. At what point do you have to know what the hard sparring feels like? The way boxers tend to. Yeah, I do think you need to. Like, I, I definitely think you need to be. I think you need to be cracked. Like, I don't. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from getting cracked. Uh, I think it busts your fantasy bubble really fast. Yeah. Right. This, this bubble of, Oh, I'm quick. And I remember when the first, the first time I won a black belt tournament and I remember leaving with sense Lacey and he wasn't being arrogant about it. He wasn't trying to be mean or anything. He just was being matter of fact. He just said, if I had to fight anybody in that tournament, I would beat them all. And I, I know like now today, I knew then he could do it. And I know it even more now because we were just all so green. Like we're mm. in the ring, like fighting and it's like, oh yeah, I'm the champ. I'm, I'm this, but until you, you don't learn that in the ring. You learn that. I find you learn that in training, right? Like I don't, I have definitely been hit hard in tournaments by people and hurt and seen stars and had my feet knocked out from underneath me, but I've never been hit like I have been when we were training in the dojo, yeah. right? That's not the way, and I don't know what it's like in every club. Like, you know, when I go over to James Club at Heritage and fight on Friday nights, they fight hard, they hit each other hard. It's, it's rank appropriate, but it's, it's not the same as when you and I come in here alone or I go alone with Sense of Legacy and we fight for an hour you got to get cracked and then you become tough. That helps you to like, it toughens your spirit, not so much your body, but it toughens your mind and your soul yeah. in a way that you're like, you know, you just got hit and you're on one knee and your sense is looking down at you and says, get up on your feet and start fighting. Yeah. <laughs> and when everything inside of you is saying, can I please just take my equipment off and go home now? <laughs> and he's looking at you saying, get on your feet, bite down on your mouthpiece and start fighting. Mm -hmm. If you don't experience that, you don't know what that is. Yeah. If you yeah. never experience that, you don't know what that, you can't know what that is. Then you're just living in some fantasy world about what you think. It's theoretical. It's not practical. It's not wisdom. It's, I don't know. That's my opinion on it. Thanks, Sensei. Um, Sensei Suino, what yeah. What's that? I want to know what Sensei Suino thinks of all that. Yeah. Uh, 
I can give you an I can give you an, a, a judo analogy, uh, which is that when I when I would play judo with, you know, I played against Olympians and and uh, and World Games competitors. That was another level too, right? Like getting hit really really hard, uh, having to deal with the fear of and the speed and the impact. Right, you, it's just it's a it's a whole nother level, and I think um, uh, it's scarier than hell. But once you deal with that for a while, you come to terms with it. So, could I ask you a question, since you know about that? Yeah, you were probably more petrified of an arm bar before you were ever in one, until you got in one and somebody started to crank on it, and you knew what it was. Then after that, so your mind can adjust to that. So for me, it's like. I was more afraid of being punched in the face until that first time when I got one and you see stars and then you don't like it, but you're like, okay, I, I lived through that and mm -hmm. I can live through that so I can get in there and I can do that again. Or being choked out would be another. Well, let, let's ask the champ because he's probably been hit harder in the face. Than yeah, any of us. yeah. <laughs> I'll catch up real quick, champ. What we were basically talking about is the difference between some touch sparring versus and something that i know boxers have is you go three four five six hard shots before you might be done in exchange and um so we're just talking about obviously the value being hit hard when you're sparring and training so that when it really happens it's not new yeah no i think it, it that that does help you prepare because um you know that way it, like you say it's not new i mean you know what it's like you can you know how to shake it up you know how to react to it so I mean, that's all preparation. I mean, that's all stuff you got to learn with defense and uh, just train yourself to be able to take what's coming at you and how to react when it does. So it's great that you learn all these things in training. So when you get into the actual competition, or actual match, you know how to react. Yeah. Um, Champ, I want to ask you something. And then, you know, we're sorry you lost your signal. We just kept the ball in the air for you. But there's something I really want to ask you. And then we're going to jump into what we call our 10 questions. But the one thing I want to ask you is you, you self-managed, self-financed, self-promoted as you're working through the pro ranks. Was that a great decision? Would you do it again the same way? What were the pros and cons of doing that? And why did you do it that way? Well, I did it because at the age, at my age, when I turned 26, when I turned pro 26, managers were looking for guys who were 20, 21. And my brother was actually at that age, he was 21. So they saw that they can get five more years out of him. So they signed him, whereas myself, I had to do it on my own. I didn't have anybody uh, looking to do that for me. But now I know a lot of those men just look back at it and they say they wish they had assigned me because they saw my grit, my determination mm. to become champion. That They probably said, man, if we had gotten this kid earlier and signed him, he could have been champion too. It's going to do it again. <laughs> Champ, don't worry about it, man. Like, this is life. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll take a minute. I'll take five minutes and tune up. <laughs> no, I, I will. When it, it's going to go off any second up. When it goes off, I'll take five minutes and charge and then come back. So you keep the ball going. It's my washing break. Okay, great. So we're going to jump into the 10 questions, and then I'm going to – or sorry, did you, were, you, were you done your question? I don't want to cut you off. No, I'm, I'm done. I, I might actually be done done for like five minutes because this might cut me off. But go ahead. <laughs> cool. Okay, great. Question number one of our 10 questions. Now, just to be clear, some of these include the word martial arts. We all consider boxing to be one of the fucking most killer, incredible martial arts. There's no separation for us between what you do and what we do. Uh, I wish I could move my hands like you, and I, I pray one day I'll throw one punch. Uh, just so you know, when I say martial arts, I mean you too. We always do. What's the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Most effective move? Yeah. My, my I think for me to slip it, slip and counter. So to let the guy throw a punch at me, slip it, and then come back. Right? Because okay. he's, he thinks he has hit me which he has, and I gotten out of the way, and I come back and make him pay for missing. <laughs> make him pay for missing. Um, who's the most influential martial artist in your life? Sugar Ray Leonard, Muhammad Ali. You know, they're not the greatest fighters that I know that influenced me. Uh, and who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all time? 
Mark, I don't know. Like Bruce Lee? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Not just um, to have a pretty face. <laughs> Um, what excites you most about your next five years, you know, moving around the ring, coaching, what, however you think about your fighting? What excites me about, uh, my, I don't know, my next five years, I'm, I'm excited just to keep teaching the youth, uh, having them learn, you know, what I can teach them. And I'm excited to see who, who, the next, uh, who the next potential champion, you know, in this area can be as a professional. Um, if heaven exists... What would you like to hear God say when you get there? <laughs> Welcome, son. <laughs> yeah. exactly, that's exactly what Sense of Legacy said. Welcome. That's what he hoped God would say. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you don't want to be unwelcome. You want to be welcome, right? Like <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've touched on this a little bit. Fave film and TV martial artist. Maybe not the most influential, but your favorite. What was the story? Favorite film and television, martial artist, boxer, whatever, however you want to think about it. Favorite? Um, I don't know. I, like I said, I, I, I love Muhammad Ali uh, because of what he stood for, not just what he did in the ring, but what he did all, all, outside the ring, um, you know, for the people, um, just what he represented. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say Muhammad Ali, you know, because like I said, it's not always all what you do in the ring. There's life after boxing. How, what, how do you carry on? How do you continue to make a difference in the lives of people around you? How do you touch their lives, right? So, yeah. Ali, Ali. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, if there's one yeah. boxer, martial artist, uh, living or dead, any time in all of history that you could train with, who would it be? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. I, I Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson. Ooh, love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, because Jack Johnson went through a lot. He, um, yeah, he went through a lot. Uh, he was, you know, uh, you know his history. Uh, how he, the women he dated, he wasn't supposed to. And uh, you know, they put him in the ring to get beat, and he'd always beat the other guys. So yeah, I, I would go with Jack Johnson. I would love to. Man, I, I would love to be a fly on the wall on you training with that man. That would be brilliant. <laughs> If everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what would it be? If they could have what I have? Yeah, you get to bestow upon them what you got from martial arts. Uh, the ability to know that they can accomplish whatever they want to in life, you know, and to not give up, you know, because for me, like I said, I learned not to give up. I learned that I can be successful doing whatever I want to do. No matter, oh, guys, sorry, bye, bye. Oh, he answered um, that pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to throw it back to Sensei Suino where he was at. And I actually wanted to add a question about it because we were talking about sort of like tr having to get hit in a way that more replicates the bigger hit in real life. What about judo on concrete? Like Sensei Dolphin and I were talking about this, like, it's fucking deadly, right? Like judo's not considered as deadly an art as it actually is. Am I wrong about that? Well, I mean, you, you throw an untrained person or even a badly trained person on concrete, right? You're, you know, game over, right? Um, but, but, um, yeah, absolutely. I just, I, I'm really interested in drawing that point about uh, about doing judo, crossing hands with somebody, getting thrown by somebody who is an Olympic level competitor, right? The, the ruthlessness, it's not anger, right? It's not, it's not something directed at you, but the ruthlessness of their technique, it's, it's irresistible. It's e extraordinarily fast. It doesn't take into account your feelings or your, um, uh, your, the sore parts of your body, right? Like it just, it's just there and boom. Uh, and, and by having been thrown by people like that a lot of times, uh, it, I, re I still respect it with the same level, but it's not as frightening as it used to be. Mm. Um, well, can I say you, you were gonna, yeah, I was, I was interested to hear your thoughts. Well, it just happens that I was also a, a student of Sensei Suino's, but, and then, so I always had to treat him like my sensei, and I still always do. 
but we were on the floor one time and uh, he he was in he was in a judo uniform. <laughs> so I thought, okay, he's gonna hug me. I'm gonna grab the back of his belt, see what he says. <laughs> I threw my arms around him, grabbed the back of his belt, and in my ear he whispered, You're gonna find out. I let him go right away. <laughs> I didn't have to hit the cement, right? So, <laughs> Judo has a good reputation. Don't, don't <laughs> I love that story. They can, be, uh, they can break your arms, your eyes, your legs, everything you have. If you're yeah. a Judo player, yeah. Yeah. No, the idea of Judo as a sport is what I'd initially read, and I, I know it is, and the Olympics make it so, but my God, I, I loved what we were talking about, Sensei Dauphin, like just the sheer height you'd achieve and then come smashing down. Um, you just said one of my favorite phrases, Sensei Suino, and I'm not sure you didn't write it down too, Sensei Dofa, since we started this show a year ago, ruthlessness of the technique. Woo! Yeah. I, well, I, I think you have, to, you have to come to terms with that because it's often not personal, right? I mean, these people, you know, you're training, if you're training in a room with 100 people who want to be in the Olympics, right? They're, they're not necessarily singling you out and going, I want to no. hurt this guy. They're just going, I want to fucking win this match and every other match until I'm in the Olympics. Right. And so, you, you know, get out of the way. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it's coming. Right. You know, the thing I wanted to say about uh, the whole, I find Sean, a lot of that stuff we talk about is in competition between two arts. When people compare karate to judo or BJJ to Wing Chun or the reality is if Sensei Suino and I leave this dojo and he's high level judo, I'm high level karate, whichever person comes up to us who's untrained is going to be in a whole different world when they try and do something <laughs> to one of us. Like it's, they're not going to know whether it was karate or judo or a fucking bus that ran them over when they wake up later. <laughs> go, what the hell just happened to me? Right? Because yeah, like, I mean, Sensei Suino gets a grip on you, gets his hips lower than you, and starts to turn. You're going on a ride that you don't want to take. It's the sudden stop, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the roller coaster that ends badly. <laughs> <laughs> um. I have a suggestion here that I wonder if you guys, it's on the fly suggestion, but uh, why don't we see if a couple of people want to turn their cameras on and um, say something about fits that maybe they learned or they didn't know or something that impacted them in the short time that we got to talk to him. So great idea. Um, okay. If you guys think that's a good idea, then while people are preparing themselves for who might get their camera turned on, um, the ones that come to mind right away is I know we have Sensei Copeland on the call and uh, I always love chatting with Sensei Copeland. So um, mm -hmm. Robbie, could you send Sensei Copeland a message and see if he wants to chat with us for a second about what he might've heard and what impacted him? Actually, Robert, why don't you take the lead on that and just ask a couple of people and when we see their camera come on, we'll know that they want to say something about what they heard from Fitz. And then we can just keep talking until that happens. Yeah, love it. Hey, Sensei. Hey, Sensei Copeland. Hi, Sensei. Hey. Hello, my favorite people. Yeah, <laughs> you too, right back at you. Awesome, it's good to see you guys. I was a little bit late joining the uh, pod chat because I was teaching also, but uh, um, uh, Fitz, he's funny. He's, he's a very funny guy. But my, my thing was, I think he's Jamaican. I don't know for sure. Is he? Do you know? That's my... Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. There you go. Another brother from the land. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. No, he's, he's got quite the, uh, quite the uh, portfolio, you know, which is, which is awesome. And his is six times defeat and then finally a win. Tough, tough road, tough road. And it's the same that, you know, we've always kind of commented on, on that. 
what you have to go through to get to where you want to be. Not everybody wants to do that. Everybody mm. wants to get paid. Nobody wants to get up to go to work in the morning. <laughs> that's, that's, just, that's just how it is, you know? So yeah, that's a perfect example. Perfect example. I enjoyed, great, by the way. I enjoyed your seminar at World Martial Arts Live so much. Sensei Copeland, it was so I, fun doing that seminar. You know what's really funny? Somebody, <laughs> I had a couple of people said to me, I thought you were talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> ah that's great which was really funny because you don't know who you're talking to because you can't see anyone right but that was an awesome awesome event that was you know and speaking of that it was a great event we'd love, love to have been part of it it was great would have been the same without you let's ask Sensei Copeland that question Sean about uh, you heard the question Sensei which one yeah uh, you have to get cracked you have to get hit oh yeah you no, have no. Right? Like you have to get cracked. No, if if you you can't you can't you can't go into the battlefield without you know knowing how to use all the tools and realizing the value of you know what's on the other end. You you it's impossible to do touch sparring and then jump into the ring and then finally get punched one day. You you can't do that. Mm-hmm. You have to train hard. And the way you train is how you're going to fight. So if you train soft, you're going to fight soft. If you train hard, then when the hard fight comes, you're ready. If it says you have to get used to what it's going to be like, and that's the only way you can actually be a champ, for sure. Absolutely. Copeland fits his back. So hey, uh, this what's is, up, my friend? Yes, this is Sensei Copeland. I'm from Jamaica. You're from Trinidad. Yes, sir. Irie, Irie. Uh, everything be Irie, man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, Sorry. Sensei Dolphin, I think Pardon? this will be five minutes, you know. Five minutes. Okay, and well, then, why don't we finish? And then you're gone again? Yeah, Sensei yeah. Copeland, why don't you hang with us while we uh, ask him the remainder of his 10 questions? Why don't Absolutely. you hang with us? That'd be awesome, sure. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you, Sensei. Hey, champ. You're on your last two, and we asked them at the same time. Okay. What's your greatest achievement? What's your greatest regret? Uh, one of my greatest achievements uh, is this has to be in the ring or outside the ring? Whatever you want. Well, I mean, one of my greatest, greatest achievements just walked away on me, but I mean, one of my greatest achievements is what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that his, was my son. his son's there. Yeah, his son's there. <laughs> That's, uh, that's, I gotta say, is my greatest achievement. You know, um, yeah. And uh, what was that? Well, any of my regrets? Greatest regret. My greatest regret. I don't know. I don't know that I have a, a great regret, you know? Um, there's some things I wish I had done differently, but I mean, I don't know that I have any great regrets. I'm not gonna hold nothing as a great regret, tell you the truth. That's not how I think. So, sorry. Don't Can't help you there. <laughs> so, I hey, want to ask. Yep. Hey, guys. I just want to thank you guys for coming for me. Thank you for having me on the show. Love you guys. It's been a great show. Awesome. Because I know it's going to go any seconds. So I just want to say my goodbyes. <laughs> so, thanks a lot, guys. Love you guys. But go ahead. And I'll, as we go, we'll just, just want to say my goodbyes. Take care, Chad. Okay, thank you. Take your sensei. Yeah, respect. Um, so Robert asked a question at Robert Schlemsky, but I want to wind it into just asking you about why, like he asked, what did you learn from running for MPP and are you going to run again? And then my question is, what was the turning point where you went, I'm dedicating my life to service. I could be doing other things, but this matters. Um, well, it was a great honor running for MPP because I mean, it was something that I was probably told, like, I'm just a boxer. That's all I am. And I'm like, you know what? No, I can do whatever I put my mind to. You can't limit me to what I can do. I may be a six time professional champion, world champion, but I can be anything I want to be. And I can be more than that. I'm not the average boxer. I wasn't put on this earth here to be normal, to be like everybody else. Mm. I was put on here to be different, to be, to succeed, to inspire others, to chase their goals and their dreams. And that's what I will continue to do. You know, uh, what, what makes me, what sets me apart from the rest is that, yeah, 
every, everybody thinks about themselves. They do for themselves. I want to do the, to serve others, to make a difference in this world. That when I leave this world, this earth, they know that Fitz the Whip was here, and he helped shape and change the lives of the people he touched. Yeah, love that. And and again, I, I think one thing I'm just like. You're so generous with it. And I don't want to get into politics at all, but the party you represented is the one that like wants free health care, more free health care, cheaper education. In other words, isn't about like, hey, I'm going to run the high end boutique gym, charge you three thousand dollars a month for your membership so you can say you're training with the champ. I want to make sure the kids get access to the champ. Where did that yeah, decision come in? They're the underdogs, right? And that's why I run to run up the NDP because I want to I want to fight for the white fight for the less fortunate, those who can't have those things, right? Uh, I'm not worried about. I mean, everybody else can be rich. What about those kids who can't afford these things, who can't, you know, who are being told they're not good enough? I want to let them know that they are good enough. They can have these things. They're worthy. Um, and you know, yeah, the NDP we want to have health care, and you know, we want everybody to be healthy, healthy. You shouldn't have a choice as to whether you're healthy or not. I gotta go. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, is okay. my screen is running right now. I'm lucky I'm still talking to you. So, but thanks, guys. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's ready to go any second. I can see it right now. But it's going. <laughs> Before it goes, what do you want to say? What do you want your camera to die on? What do you want to talk about for your last 30? There you go. We got it That's done. It. <laughs> I fucking love a guy who champions the underdog, man. You know? You know, Sean, I just got to say, like, he's not, um, he's not say like, he's not self-promoting himself, but if you think of uncomfortable situations for kids, like, really, like, I mean, I know for a fact that Fitz goes into the hospital with kids who got like tubes stuck into their head, their arms are all taped up and he just sits there and reads them stories and tells them like, you got this, you can, you can get through this. You can, you know, that's the kind of man that he is. And when he's around here, like, I remember I went to go pay my city taxes one, one time, my property taxes. And I hear this voice, right? Like I'm at this wicket and I hear this voice and I look over and I'm like, I'll fight you champ he looks over right and just walks over and gives you like the biggest hug like just smile when you see him he smiles right away he's always genuine he doesn't try and misrepresent himself and if you need something from him and you ask him that guy will turn himself inside out to try and give you whatever it is that you asked him for if he believes you need it right he's despite the camera coming off and on, like I really love that guy and he's an awesome human being. I wish we need more Fitz the Whip Vanderpools and in the world today. Um, yeah, you can tell he's pretty authentic. Yeah, we just got a message from Robert that one of uh, his students has a comment and he asked, would patch her through, let's do it. Yeah, put him on. Yeah, yeah. We'd, we'd love to see the student. I think it's a her and we look forward to meeting her. Put them on or is yeah. her or she or him or they, whatever they identify as. She can't turn on the camera. Never mind. Okay. Uh, she can't turn on the camera, but what she wanted to say is champ is truly an incredible person. He continues to support the most vulnerable populations, including the indigenous people. He has gone above and beyond for my family during our toughest times as a local indigenous family. Wow. What a beautiful message. Thank you for wow. sharing that. That's huge. It says volumes. Yes. It says volumes. You know, it's real easy to do things for show. Um, what do you think the difference is between a human who goes, I'm going to like say, nah, I'm too busy. Some people are busy, but, and goes, no, nah, I have time for this. Like, I'd love to know, let's say, I'll start with you, Sensei Copeland. Like, what do you think makes someone go, sure, I'll help with that, even though it's tough, even though it costs my time versus somebody who goes, yeah, fuck it. Selflessness selflessness he doesn't think about himself the benefit for him is what he can do for others i mean to see somebody else grow is what gives him value that's what gives him joy so completely selflessness 
the base for being a samurai. There you go. Woo. The word samurai means manservant. Yeah. That's what we're here to do. They're, they're here to do. How can I be of service to you? That's right. I love that. I'm so glad I asked that question. I got like, <laughs> I got goosebumps right now for real. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everyone on this call and anyone who's listened knows that I don't drink or do drugs. And, and the fundament to being able to maintain that is trying to be a service. You know, when I make it about me, things don't go great. When I make it about the other guy, things tend to go pretty well. Yeah, you have to see where the benefit for you is in serving too, Sean, right? And what yeah. you see is that the more you serve others, the more you get back in return. 100%. Um, so it becomes something, it just becomes something that it's easy to do. The yeah. person who never served ever and never got anything back doesn't know what, we all teach martial arts, so you know. Right. You could spend your time hitting the bag, making yourself better, hoarding all that skill and all that knowledge to yourself. What good is it to the world then? What good is it to... Whereas when we share it with everybody, we get back tenfold what we share with people. Tenfold you get back. Rick Johnson's birthday today. Wow. Happy birthday, Rick. He said, he said give, give something to somebody and see how much you get back. Uh, he was the guy who said that in one of our previous shows. And Rick Johnson was a big, big man. And I don't mean just in stature. Hey, Sensei Legacy and Sensei Copeland. Uh, something interesting happened on Punch Kick Joke Chat, which is that um, we actually did the last interview with Master Billy Hine. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's the last one. And uh, I think it would be fitting in the last four or five minutes if we just chatted about him just for a little bit um, and encourage people to go ah. back and watch that episode again and what he had to say and, and what happened there. Um, and I know, like, I interacted with him a few times. Sensei Benson interacted with him a few times. But obviously, Sensei Legacy interacted with him a truckload of times. Sensei Copeland, did you ever interact with Sensei Hein? Oh yeah, we we've had we have moments, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's all you had with Billy Hines was moments, you know. <laughs> <You're> fighting, <laughs> and I was I was uh, I was kind of shocked to see that he had passed. I'm like, oh my goodness, I could not believe it. You know, it was um, it was a little it was a little shocking, but yeah, he was he was something else, toughest nails. And he, you know, he's, he has a very distinctive voice, you know, that always kind of like penetrates. <laughs> His voice penetrates. That's the that's that's the uh, that's the thing. And yeah, he was he was he was a great he was a great person. we <laughs> yes, we've we've had moments, <laughs> but they were good. I mean, they were good, of course, you know. Sensei but, like talks about his penetrating voice too <laughs> when he started training yeah tell, tell everybody said say what it used to be like when he'd be on one side of the dojo and you'd be on the other side <laughs> of the dojo. well we'd be, we'd be in uh master benny allen's class and you never knew if billy hines liked you or not <laughs> <laughs> i i love the guy he was like my mentor like a guy i looked at with my mouth open, you know, but he never, like, you could walk up to him and say something, he'd just look at you. He wouldn't say anything. So it was a bit intimidating. So I used to come from London to train on the weekends at Benny Allen's Club. And I think he liked me because yeah. whenever he said, okay, pay her off, you'd always hear him yell, legacy, and that penetrating. <laughs> Everyone else would run off the floor, off to the side, so I could walk over to him, right? <laughs> yeah, we were all a bit, uh, we loved the guy, but we were also very aware that uh, our, our nickname for him was the Tasmanian Devil. Once he started to fight, that's, how, hammer. that's how he moved, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. called him the Hammer. <laughs> yeah, everybody had their own name for the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sean, I think we should go around the horn the way we always do with our thoughts on fits. Sensei Copeland, join us. Love to hear your 
your thoughts on Fitz as well. And we should talk about what the next couple of weeks is going to bring. And the one thing I also want to say is, despite all of that, we didn't lose one person. Everybody has stayed logged on and continued mm-hmm. to listen. So thank you very much for hanging in with us. Yeah. This is just one of those things. You, it's an experience that you get to experience, right? It's just a new experience. Thanks for that. <laughs> next week will be free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that sense of fan. I totally agree. Hanchi Legacy, why don't you uh, start us off with your thoughts about well, genuine champion, a real champion, uh, also uh, a very honest person who likes to be able to help his community. Like, I mean, that's that's a lifetime in a nutshell. Much respect. I know him not very, very well, but I know him. And every time you're standing in front of him, you know he's the champion, but he's always very polite. Thanks, Hanchi. Sensei Copeland? Well, I, I don't know him well, but just from you know my perception, very humanitarian heart and uh, an easy person to like. Obviously, you can tell he's you know he's uh, and I I have this feeling that he's a prankster too. I have this feeling that he's a prankster for sure. <laughs> which, which is, these are all good qualities, though, right? You, know? you mean you mean his phone really wasn't off? <laughs> Nah. <laughs> he's like fuck this i'm out yeah <laughs> uh, yeah I, li- I like that we, the way you just said that though you know w- we have a great phrase in the acting world which is take the work seriously but don't take yourself seriously exactly you know some people exactly. get a little caught up and it's like no the work matters but come on uh sensei suino uh I, I loved it i love the time we had with him um I wish we I wish we had more. I think he'd be a wonderful in-person interview and hopefully we can do that at some point. <laughs> um, uh, but this show is is proving to me to be kind of like a mythbusters. Um, so many people think martial artists and boxers are ruffians. And yeah, I'm sure there are some, right? There are a lot of but but even MMA fighters, you know, a lot of hockey players, a lot of martial artists, a lot of boxers are actually just really wonderful people. And they just happen to be involved in combat in some way. Mm. And, you know, I think that's another example of uh, uh, that arc that we keep seeing. People go into fighting for a lot of reasons. <laughs> how, you know, if they stay in it long enough not to be quitters, they come out the other end as amazing human beings. I just love that. That's awesome, Sensei Suno. And I remember there was a period in the MMA when it was first becoming hugely popular where people were shocked at how many of the fighters had university degrees because of how many wrestlers were running the game at the time. We hadn't hit the generation now where you can like look up and just go, I'm just going to be an MMA fighter. You had to come in through a discipline. And there were so many wrestlers doing well and they all had college degrees. And people were like, wait, they're so well-spoken. They took a legit degree and happened to wrestle. Uh, it, it, I love what you're saying. And I, I totally agree. Sensei Dovan? Yeah, you know, Sean, as Sensei Suno is saying that, I think um, one of the things that if I look back and when I was younger, and I would look at people like Sensei Legacy or Sensei Copeland and you're like, you're enamored with that, that skill level, which is a violent skill. Like it can be a violent skill, at least for me, that's, that's what it is. But then when you get close to them, it's just, they're just such real people, right? Like mm. it turns into something real. Like Johnny Terrio, the first time I ever walked up to him, you're walking up to him with awe, like, oh, oh and he just he doesn't feel the awe that you're looking at. <laughs> it doesn't feel the awe that we look at yeah. with. He just feels like a human being, right? He just feels like a regular guy. And he's uncommon amongst uncommon people. But specifically about tonight, I do know Fitz well. I, I know him very well. He's texting me apologies right now saying, I'm really sorry that my, my camera dropped. I feel really bad. And I don't want him to feel bad. Um, I still learned a truckload from him Mm. and I enjoyed a lot of the things he had to say, you know, like, for example, what we were talking about service, that the most precious thing you can give somebody is your time. Right. He said that he said the most precious thing, because I guess in a sense, you're giving them you, your life. (laughs) Time you could have done something else. You're giving that to them. I like when he talked about being a kid, milk and biscuits, holding onto the table, 
not wanting to come to Canada because it was too cold here. I can't blame them. <laughs> I would be excited to go to Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago, and I don't think I'd be excited to come back here. And just uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really just liked how openly he didn't avoid losing. Mm. You know, and it's interesting because I think of that in the boxing world, you know, who's O will go like 38 and O and 38 and O and who's O will go, who will, I feel like that's almost gone now. MMA has eradicated that. It's about the fights and the fighter. It's not about the record anymore. And, but I do like that. He just talked about that so openly. Like, I think it takes a lot of courage. Um, I like what Cedric Goblin said about him too. Man, like if somebody beats you six times and you're still like, I am fucking not going to stop until I beat that guy. And he did. Like he, he did that. He, he went back. Obviously, I like, I love Sugar Ray Leonard. I absolutely, if there is any person who is no longer in existence on the earth that I could bring back and meet with and hang around for a minute, five minutes a day, it would be Muhammad Ali. I would love to spend any amount of time and that's his sugar Ray leonard and muhammad ali are his guys too so yeah. i feel like we align there um in the end there he said people think i'm just a boxer right i think we all can relate to that somewhat we all feel pigeonholed into something even if you're not a martial artist I'm just a dad i'm just a factory worker i'm just a mcdonald's worker i'm just a no you're so much more than that mm. right and when he said, I can do whatever I set my mind to, whatever, and everybody can do that. They just got to set their mind to it. And then Seth Sweeney talks about it with permissions. You have this idea, you set your mind to it, you write a plan, you execute on the plan, you get people to hold you accountable to it. Um, and I just really liked in the end when he said, like, he works with those kids, because those underprivileged kids, because he wants them to know that they're worth it. Yeah. Right? That they're worth it like they have something to offer and they're worth it i could have been one of those kids if i didn't run into many of the people on this call mm -hmm. right now right i could have been one of those kids just running around the streets of windsor riding motorcycles doing bad things but people showed me different ways to to do different things thanks sensei that's awesome um, I'm just going to reiterate a bit of what's been said, you know, and the, the big thing for me is the openness with loss. I grew up in an environment where only succeeding was to be talked about, only uh, your wins were to be discussed, and it didn't help me as a martial artist, it didn't help me as a performer, ultimately, uh, I had to unlearn that, I had to learn that you lose to win, and in life, my greatest, uh, I wouldn't say my greatest loss, I don't know how you categorize that, my greatest period of losing was followed by the greatest flourish I could ever imagine. And the idea that he lost a bunch of fights and then from that learned how to be champ. I love that because I didn't grow up with that paradigm. <clears throat> and the idea that that's the garden from which your fucking championship grows if you let it or you quit. And uh, I just love not quitting. And obviously the idea of service and helping those kids. I mean, that's just a beautiful thing. Um, I could go on and on about how my life flourishes when I help others and how it doesn't when I don't. Uh, but I think that's enough to say it that way. Sensei Dofa, um, tell us about our next two weeks. Well, next week is a host chat. Hey. Oh. Do you think we'll be able to fill the time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm proud of us. So just as a reminder for the host chat, I feel fairly confident we'll probably see Sensei Copeland. He'll probably be <laughs> um, <He's laughs> obligated. Which I'm excited about. And remember, if you join in on the host chat, you get to ask all kinds of questions. Yeah. And we like to turn your camera on and chat with you a little bit uh, about whatever your question might be. So that's always fun. I think for us, it's fun to interact with the people who always come every week. I yeah. really personally enjoy that a lot. Yeah. So that's happening next week. And then the week after that, we have Mark Hominick coming on. <laughs> and Mark Hominick is our first connection to the UFC. Um, in my opinion, I still say if uh, he had had a minute more with Jose Aldo, he would have been the lightweight champion of the world. He had him on the ropes. He was on the verge of, and he lost the decision. But um, also a person that said legacy knows well, and like I know fairly well, good, really good man, really good human being. I think everybody will 
enjoy hearing what Mark has to say um, and great connections to the UFC. Um, and I'm also thinking we should tell him to make sure that his camera battery is going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so that we all can chat a little more. Because yeah, right. For me, but um, it is a note for anybody who's watching is to make sure your battery is charged. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's what we have for the next two weeks, Sean. That's awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. I love the host chat. And I, I especially, you know, um, we all love the martial arts and, there's great organizations out there, but as far as MMA goes, we all know UFC is the show, you know, they're the Bitcoin of UFC or, or of MMA. And so it's going to be exciting to have that link. And, and it's a nice thing for a show to grow that way um, in different directions. You know, we got a world champ boxer tonight. we got a UFC fighter in two weeks. Uh, and I'm saying this to people watching, but also to us, we've built a really nice little thing here. And, uh, and it's nice to always have it rooted in our traditional friends like Sensei Copeland, but also to be going, yeah, we're also going to get into that boxing world, get into that MMA world and do it for real. Sensei, were you just going to say something? Yeah, I just was going to say, but the next three after that, because we, you know, we like to plan out a little farther, um, is again another host chat. And we're back to traditional martial arts for the next three after that. We have really strong traditional martial artists. We have uh, a compatriot of Sensei Sandoval, who's going to be coming on, uh, Ron Lindsay. And one of the biggest supporters of this show, Al Panekia, will be on a wow. uh, real badass judo player um, from, from this day and back in the day. So mm -hmm. we got lots of episodes coming up. Love it. Love it. Like spending your Thursday night with us. We like having you here. And uh, <laughs> it'll be a fun summer. So good. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. It's so nice to be back with you all. I always feel so honored. And I really do feel like I'm in the backseat of this car. And uh, uh, I'm glad you, you have me along for the ride. Stay safe, and we'll see you in a week, everybody. See you.